Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Monica Marino and I am Senior Director for Care and Support at the Alzheimer's Association. Whether you're joining us on Facebook Live or Zoom, we're really glad that you're able to join us today. I especially wanna give a big warm welcome to Rod and Deb. Rod is living with mild cognitive impairment and Deb is his wife of almost 23 years. But thank you so much. It's so nice to see you both again and really appreciate you joining us to kind of share your story. I wanna make sure that I get to all of my questions. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Now, as both of you know, the Alzheimer's Association has developed the 10 warning signs. And we know that each person can experience warning signs differently, just as the disease impacts each person differently as well. And so what may be cause for concern for one person may not be cause for concern for someone else. And Rod, I know in speaking with you, you had mentioned that you first started to notice some cognitive changes right after your retirement. Can you share with us what some of those symptoms were and how they were unique to you? I'd put them in two categories, I guess. One is geographic ability or travel ability, knowing where I'm going. And the other is uh, memory events of one kind or another. Uh, as, an exa as examples of each, uh, actually two years prior to being diagnosed, uh, I was still at work. I was on an errand that I was not uh, unfamiliar with, finished the errand and couldn't find my way back to work. I was taking wrong turns, uh, geographic confusion. I finally used a GPS to find my way back. Uh, under memory events, uh, again, while I was still working in quality assurance, I was reading a document that, gee, I wonder who wrote this, and it was me. I just forgot that I had written it. Uh, and also uh, on a more personal level, a couple of years ago, we had rented a cabin on a lake in Minnesota and had children and grandchildren come and spend time with us at that cabin. It's not in my memory. I can look at photographs of the time and recognize people and so forth, but it's just not in my memory, at least not that I can gather in. Yeah. We also know that one of the warning signs can be withdrawal from social activities or loss of interest. And you had shared with me your love for playing the guitar. Can you talk a little bit about how that changed for you as well? Uh, it has changed. Uh, I used to just pick up a guitar. I would give an evening and fiddle with it a little bit. I played guitar, not professionally, but uh, as a personal involvement for many years. And um, I think for me, it was struggling with mem remembering some of the finger positionings for different chords. Um, and it just sort of bothered me. And I slowly stopped uh, using the guitar for just personal relaxation of an evening. Yeah. I've done that now in a good long time. Yeah. And, and Deb, you know, you probably know Rod the best. You guys have been married almost 23 years. You see him on a daily basis. Can you talk a little bit about what were some of the changes that you started to notice with Rod over the course of time? Well, some of the things that I was noticing, um, he, he just his emotional uh, responses to things sometimes seemed a little different. Um, he seemed like he was getting a little more, either he was very apologetic about things he was doing incorrectly. Maybe he forgot to get something at the pickup of our, us for lunch. And he would be very, uh, very apologetic about it and, and more so than necessary. Um, and I saw little things just around the house that were just a little bit off. Um, I wouldn't say I didn't see anything. I saw nothing humongous. The things that Rod are talking about were the huge warning signs for us that something wasn't right. But I was picking up, I think maybe what they call executive functioning skills. I was seeing some of that when we use a computer together to work on our bills. Um, but it was more minor type of things that I saw until these other events occurred. Now, you had also shared with me that during the course of about a year and a half, you were taking notes on this, <laughs> correct? Yes, I was. Um, I was to the point because we had sought help through a neurologist and we were not getting um, favorable feedback from him. And I was beginning to feel like I was crazy because I was seeing all of these little things, missed turns, uh, forgotten where Arby's is, uh, little things that just didn't make sense. And I started keeping a log for about a year and a half before the diagnosis of um, details that disturbed me. Enough that I started saying, there is a true pattern here. 
I did use some of those notes to write a specific letter to the, to the neurologist prior to an event of us attending so that he would be aware of my concerns without me having to voice them with Rod there. Um, and so that was very helpful. Since the diagnosis, I have not felt so inclined to keep notes like I did before. <laughs> now, I think that's a great tip for families who may be seeing some cognitive changes either in themselves or someone else to kind of just take the time to put those notes down because when you go to visit the doctor, it's really helpful to be able to reflect back and be able to share what some of those changes are. I think, you know, Rod, you did a really great um, job of just kind of explaining these changes were very unique to you, right? You said you never got lost. You could go to one place one time and you know how to get back there. And so for you to have to I think you had said at one point you pulled over the side of the road and had to use GPS, which you never had to do before. That's something that's very unusual for yourself. And so I think just important to recognize again that these warning signs are different in everyone and they can impact different, um, different individuals in different ways. So, you know, a lot of the work that I do is being able to work with families like yourself. And a lot of times we hear about this turning point, some event that happened in which it made the individual or their family say to themselves, this is not normal. Something more serious is going on. And Rod, you touched a little bit around the phone call that you had with your daughter. Can you talk a little bit more in detail about that conversation and the family camping trip? And then we're going to touch a little bit around what that felt like to completely lose this memory um, of an event that occurred in which you had been a part of. The phone call was probably a year after the event. And I, I chat with my daughters, I wouldn't say regularly, but frequently on the phone. And in one occasion on the conversation, my daughter, Laura, was recalling having visited us at that cabin and on that lake in Minnesota. They live in Minnesota. And uh, it was a blank for me. And it was uh, hard to participate in the conversation because I didn't have any specifics to um, reflect about. I, I was uh, sort of bland, I guess, in my responses during that conversation. And afterward uh, was uh, more than a little upset that I didn't remember any of that. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I could look at photographs, recognize everybody in the photographs, but it's just not in my memory anymore, or yeah. I can't. And that was a whole week right, of that, that event that took place with your family. Yes, it was a whole week. That you could not recall, yeah. We know that one of the most difficult conversations for families to have is the conversation about memory concerns that they may be observing in a family member or friend. And so I'm just curious, you know, Rod, after you had this call with your daughter and, and you had shared you were really distraught over the fact that you could not remember this event, can you both talk a little bit about the conversation that you had after that phone call and what had just occurred? Well, my memory of our conversation after the phone call is also sort of lost to me, other than the fact that I know that we shared that experience and we, we've had a, an established communication level where, where we don't mask things from one another. And, and I felt a great deal of comfort and uh, support from Deb in connection with that specific event, but other things too. For me, I saw was Rod was sort of bland in his response to Laura. I felt like something was going on on the phone that I wasn't aware of because I could not hear both sides of the conversation. But when he, he hung up, he asked me about it. And when I started talking to him, I was stunned that he didn't remember it. And a great deal of sadness happened. Um, Rob became very cheerful and uh, I was too, you know, and his question was, how can I forget something that important? How can I forget something that we created for our, ch our children? You know, what he was questioning himself as a person, honestly. And the other thing that came about from that is we realized in this journey, a lot of times we don't know what we don't know until an event happens. And that was a really big example of that for us. Yeah. So there may be others listening today on Facebook or on Zoom, and they may be asking, what are some of the tips and strategies that you would recommend 
in approaching someone to have this conversation. Rod, I'm, I want to start with you first and what your suggestions would be to others. Well, I think generally open communication is essential. Uh, and gentleness and kindness, dealing with uh, the communication, let alone the other person, in genuine love is, is the basis for good communication in any case, and especially in cases of difficulty. Uh, it was, it was uh, very difficult for me to realize that I hadn't retained that memory, but because uh, we talked about it and we were gentle with each other, it's okay. I can deal with it. Yeah. And Deb, for you, what would you say to a care partner or caregiver who is recognizing this in a family member, a spouse? Well, I, I, as Rod said, you know, you, you, you approach it with love and tenderness. Um, but I also am very uh, pragmatic and I'm very frank. So I did not mince my words about it. I didn't, you know, cover it up or, or sugarcoat it. I was clear, but I said, you know, we have, we have a problem, Rod, let's figure this out, you know, and, and we had, got, we need to go back to the neurologist. We need to share this with him. There's got to be something that's, that maybe has not been discovered yet. Um, and it was truly a pivotal point in, in us getting more help. Um, but my, I guess my response was be clearly spoken and, and just do it out of love. And I also believe in persistence. If someone is maybe turning away from it, doesn't mean that you can't revisit that later on. Absolutely. Sometimes this conversation, because it's so difficult and sensitive, needs to occur over time or multiple times, right? Um, and the Alzheimer's Association does offer a tool. It's called 10 Tips to Approach Memory Concerns, which really helps families kind of outline what are some of the things that they should be considering in, in being able to have this conversation with the individual that they're concerned about, or if they're concerned about themselves and, and they don't really know how to approach this with their families. So Rod, I know after the call that you had with your daughter, you decided, I know you talk about, we were going to see another urolog neurologist, we're getting a, a second opinion. Um, and when you were given the diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment, also known as MCI, can you talk a little bit about your reaction to that diagnosis? Well, I'd like to put this in the perspective of uh, my life, our life together. We, uh, we live a faith-based life. Now, perfectly, no, <laughs> but, but if, if it weren't for the power of faith, I don't think I could have anything close to a positive reaction. Having had the diagnosis, it felt uh, good to have something specific to assign all of this to. It, it was understandable. And, and uh, even though the details were clouded, it was still a group understanding or a, a collective understanding of what was really going on. And Deb, how did you respond to his diagnosis? Um, I responded in kind, pretty much. I honestly, it felt like um, it was uh, a sense of you, you are on the right track. You haven't been hypervigilant. We were actually called hypervigilant by a doctor. You know, we <laughs> truly were on a path of discovery and we weren't going to quit until we got to some place. And honest to goodness, I did not want it to be Alzheimer's. I would have been happier with something else, but that was not the journey that we were supposed to be on for some reason. And um, we accepted it again. Uh, like Rod says, you know, we are a faith-based couple. And one of the things that he did was pray. And the prayer was that God, please use us for those that are coming behind us so that maybe we can benefit others. And that, or that turned me around from looking inside of myself to looking at others in a nicer way or more gentle way. Yeah. And Rod, I have to say, um, I've talked to many individuals living with Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment or other forms of dementia. And what you shared as far as a sense of relief and knowing the cause of your symptoms, that is something that I have heard over and over again, just knowing that I'm not crazy. Like there is, there is something causing this to happen to me. And now I know what I can do. I need to plan for the future. There are benefits to getting a diagnosis as with any disease, right? That someone may have. And so um, I just wanted to say that is something that I hear over and over again, just that sense of relief and knowing the cause of what those symptoms are. 
Now, you both shared with me when we talked before how the diagnosis has really had a positive impact on your relationship, especially as it pertained to having deeper conversations and really thinking about the future and making decisions together. Can you, and that, that being one of the benefits, right, of an early diagnosis and really knowing what you're dealing with. Can you talk a little bit about the conversations that you've had, especially around driving? I thought that was a really great example of those discussions that you've had about what's going to happen in the future, Rod, when you may no longer be able to drive. That was something that was brought up early after the diagnosis, knowing that that will be an eventuality. And from my perspective, again, I was very concerned with my husband and him maintaining his individuality, his independence uh, as long as possible. I didn't want to be the person to, you know, put the hammer down and say, no, just because you had this diagnosis, you can't drive anymore. So the way we looked at it was we went through steps and, um, at this point in life, it's been several years since the diagnosis, and there has been some changes. And one of the changes that I've noticed has been making uh, quick decisions, you know, a quick turn here, or if you miss a spot, you can still, it, it, you're just not making the, those quick decisions. So we've kind of modified the route that he takes. I mean, he goes to certain places all the time, but if there's a specific place that uh, doesn't have curbs to it or it's windy, curvy, I just say, I'm driving, honey. This is my time to drive. And, and it's worked out for both of us. We also create a list of uh, what we thought would be signs of it's time to quit. And we also decided that it would be nice. And I, I, I approached Rod with this. I said, Rod, I don't want to be the one to say it's time. I don't want the burden of that. I want you to help me. And that impacted Rod greatly, I think. So we hope that it will be a mutual decision that we come to. And I, and I trust Will. Uh, I, it would be wrong for me to burden Deb with that dictum responsibility. And, and so I'm cognizant of my, my driving procedures. I think about it uh, and, and I, I believe we can make the decision together. Tell them about the note. Ah, we, well, I did write a note to Deb, a, a vow, if you will, a driving vow that uh, basically says that I respect her view and I will accept her opinion under every circumstance. And this is specifically to include it's time to no longer drive. I, I don't cherish that opportunity coming along, but it will. Probably. And it, it's not just for my safety, but for safety of folks on the road with me that, that uh, have to do this. Yeah, I think it's wonderful that you both have had the opportunity because of your early diagnosis to be able to have these conversations together about driving. Deb, for you, knowing that when there, the time comes that you have to make some difficult decisions like driving, you know what decision to make because you've already had that conversation with Rod and he's kind of given you permission to say when the time comes, it's okay for you to do this and this, right? And, and that's, the, that's one of the great benefits, I think, of, of an early diagnosis is having the ability to include the person living with the myocognitive or the cognitive impairment to be part of those discussions. That's great. So I want to ask, you know, so many uh, families that I speak to, or, or even those that I don't encounter, think that they have to go through this disease alone. And they don't know that there are resources available through the Alzheimer's Association to help them through this journey, right? No one should have to go through this disease alone. And so can you talk a little bit about after the diagnosis, what did you do in order to kind of build that support and get yourself connected to help you through this journey and, and to deal with the diagnosis that you had been given? Well, at first it was um, a solo act as, as you've described it, well, a duet. And, and, and I knew about the 800 number for the Alzheimer's Association. I suggested that we need to use that and take whatever advantage we can from it, and we did. And it introduced a, a whole panoply of things, of, of opportunities that are available for folks who are fighting this uh, particular disease. And it, it has encouraged us and given us resources that we hadn't imagined existing. What was interesting about that is during that period of time, I was in deep distress. I was tearful. I was having a hard time getting through each day. And Rod looked at me and says, you know, we can't continue this way, Dad. We've got to do something. And he just immediately Googled 
you know, the Alzheimer's Association and found that number and was connected immediately to, via the helpline to someone in Georgia, which is where we're located that day. And immediately we got connected with the Zoom group. And um, it was it, it was it was a godsend. It was a true godsend. And, and after you made that phone call, then you got connected to your local chapter, you participated in support groups, and really today you've actually taken the opportunity to share your story with others because I know it's so deeply important for you to be able to be there and help others um, from your experiences. So we appreciate that. That's great. Let me ask one last question. What would you tell someone who's just starting in this journey? So Rod, I'm going to go to you first, someone who just recently got a diagnosis and really hasn't had a chance to kind of put their arms around what's just happened to them. Well, first of all, I, I would strongly suggest open communications. Don't stand there by yourself and try to absorb whatever it is. All right, of course, talk to medical professionals, but Talk to your family, talk to your friends, let them know what you're what you seem to be up against. And to be really frank, honest with all those folks about anything that uh, you are experiencing that as as an individual now in, impacted by Alzheimer's. Uh, open communication is, is an absolute necessity. Uh, early diagnosis is very important because it gives you that extra time and it gives you uh, the opportunity to participate in your own management. and uh, But uh, yeah, open communication is it, uh, it, it's essential. And Deb? Well, I feel the same way, but I would like to say this. I think one of the reasons people are do not have open communication about this is fear. There's a lot of fear about this diagnosis. There's a lot of, there's a stigma attached to it that makes you think that, gee, if I have this diagnosis, I'm going to be, uh, you know, in a hospital bed in the next two years. And that is not the truth. I mean, Rod has been diagnosed with this for over two years and probably has been having symptoms for four years, still drives, still preaches. And so what I would like people to know is that there is a true life between the diagnosis and whatever God calls us home via the Alzheimer's route or something else. There are many, many years to be lived fully. And I would not let fear interrupt that. That's a great message. And, you know, certainly um, I think the important thing out of all of this is that you can still live a meaningful and quality life in the very early stage of, of Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment. And both of you are, are certainly a true testament to that. I wanna thank you both so much for spending time and sharing your experience and just really having the courage to be so open and candid because I know that this is gonna be so helpful to so many others. So thank you so much for your time and in, in, in sharing your story with us today. It's a privilege to have the time with you. Great.